so welcome to the Energizing America podcast, where we talk all things energy and why we need it in our business, communities, and life. Today, we're sitting down with Mr. Jeffrey Hammonds. He has been with Westcom for just over a year, right? Yes, sir. Welcome. Your first podcast? Yes, sir. Awesome. Well, this is going to be fun. So, Jeffrey, you came in um, about a year ago. You are you started out as our electrical and automation operations uh, manager down here in the Permian Basin. As we continue to grow, I'm sure we're going to uh, have some structural changes as we think about separating those two departments out, electrical and automation, but I'm sure those things will come. Since you've been here, though, how many people have you hired? Any idea? 20, 30, 40? Oh, man. Probably up high 20s, maybe 30. Yeah, because we, we're we about 25 people in the electrical and automation department, and as it goes in the oil field, not everyone survives past yeah, their... So, yeah. <laughs> and it's not always us. A lot of times it's the employee. Yeah, we had, a, we had a couple of stints there where probably one out of every three people that we hired didn't last a week. You know, I think that was about three months straight where we ran into that. And what was driving that? Just folks not familiar enough with the basin to realize the challenges of the oil and gas industry? Or what do you think was contributing to folks not sticking around? I, I think there were several different factors, but one of the biggest ones that we've seen where, yeah, people get here and they just, maybe they don't have a good idea of how far away the sites are and how crappy the roads are, you know, and it's a, it's a struggle just to get to location. Some of those guys that, you know, when they tell you that it's, I understand. I completely, it's not for everyone. Yeah, well, and there's so. certain things like we talk a lot about. There are some things that we can make better and we can do differently as a company. Mm -hmm. And then there's these inherent things about our industry that are just, they are what they are. And so if those things are hiccups for folks, they're probably just not a good fit, such as a site being an hour and a half away. We're not going right. to get away from that in the oil field. I'm, I'm pretty brutally honest in my interviews and kind of tell people the ups and downs, both the, the pros and cons of being here in the Permian and, um, you know, the particular individual that came from California and great candidate, super smart guy. I told him how, how far away the locations were, how much driving was involved. How, how bad a shape the roads were in and he was cool with it all and then he got here and he realized he was not i think he lasted three days and then he called me on sunday and he was headed back to california so <laughs> <laughs> so what you obviously i mean you you actually haven't been in the oil field all that long yourself but you came from a different background you spent some time in the armed forces and and did your duty as a as a countryman so thank you yes, for sir. that as yes, a uh, great service and spent some time overseas in afghanistan and Yes. So this had to be quite a transition for you. What are some of the things that made it easier for you that these folks ain't getting? The individual from California, for example, right? He's mm -hmm. new to the oil field. But Jeffrey Hammonds, 13 months ago, was new to the oil field. What separated your ability to to accept those things about the oil field versus a fellow from California? In the military, I mean, everything was a struggle, and I kind of feel that way in the oil field. I don't care what type of plan and how much thought you put into it. It's There's going to be some changes and some hiccups. So that was one thing that I've always kind of been trained to to adapt, right? That's, what, that's one of the kind of things they, they teach you is adapt and overcome, right? So here in the oil field, that's when I started out climbing towers and climbing towers in Weatherford. That right there was an hour and a half from my house, so I was already making that drive. About a month in, they I started coming out here to New Mexico. About two months after that, they asked me if I wanted to move over here. It's just been a constant change, and I, I don't know if it's something that I thrive on, but I'm okay with it. I, I think that's one thing that the military kind of helped me with is change is not always what you want it to be, but it's not always, doesn't have to be bad, you know? kind of is what you make of it so so you think that you think the skill that the military teaches about adapting and overcoming is super critical in the in the oil field or maybe not even critical but it allowed you to adapt easier than the fellow from california I, I absolutely think so especially on the service side right running maintenance calls and things like that i mean you can sit down and spend a couple hours and try to plan your day out but it will not go that way and that's kind of where i've always been is on the maintenance side you know running trouble calls and might be headed to uh, to Odessa, and you get a call, and you have to turn around and go to you know, Roswell or Hobbs. So, you know, if, if you're the type of person that lets those things get to you because your plan changed, then it's not going to work out here. You know, you have to you have to be able to adapt on the fly and 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 still have a good day. Yeah, <laughs> don't let it ruin your day. And and really, it's it's interesting how much time we spend behind the windshield as oh, yeah. electricians or <clears throat> environmental techs, automation techs, whatever our position is in the oil field. We get some serious windshield time. Has that been difficult for you or is it just, are you are you comfortable with that hour and a half? What do you do during that time when you're on the road? When I first started, I, I just listened to a lot of music. You know, I'm a big music buff. I, love, I like listening to music. And then, uh, like you said, there's a lot of windshield time. So eventually you get tired of 
listening to music. So I have an Audible subscription. I listen to a lot of audiobooks, a ton of audiobooks. What's your favorite kind of audiobook? Western. Western. Fiction. Okay. Yeah, I listen to a lot of the, the fiction westerns. I, I, I try to get into the historical stuff and I do every once in a while, but it's just nice to be able to tune your brain out and just listen to something that doesn't matter. It's just a story, you know, yeah. entertaining. So on the drive here, I usually, that's the last thing I listen to to try to just calm down and get ready for the chaos that's about to come. So other than that, I do listen to some podcasts. It's kind of a hit or miss. There's some uh, murder mystery podcasts that sometimes catch my attention. So kind of a crapshoot on, on what the day is and how I'm feeling on what I listen to, but it's a mixture of all of those things for sure. Do you ever have a quiet drive? Yes, actually. There's a lot of times where you know, you, you start to drive off and you don't, you're not playing any music and next thing you know, four hours have gone by and you're here. And isn't that anything. awesome? It is. It, it really is. And sometimes I, I think you really need that, you know, um, kind of clear your mind and get yeah. some thoughts squared away. I do some flying and I do a lot of driving and I'm always shocked by how much noise people need in their ears. And I, I'm a, I like to run. So when I run, that's kind of my quiet time. Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of dreaming when I'm running and solve a lot of world problems and people's problems that they don't even know they have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and they never get to hear my solution for them. But I, I think sometimes just being able to tune your brain out when you're in a leadership role is super important. Like just turn right. your mind off and just let it run. Yeah. And what are some of the similarities between the military background and the oil field background when it comes to leadership? I think the military leadership style it's it's kind of it's kind of strange because you don't you don't have a choice. There's no options. You can't say no, you can't just not do it, right? If it's a lawful order, I mean you have to follow it. So the the approach by the employee, we'll say, or the soldier, you know, when you get an order in the military, there's there might be a little bit of complaints and gripes, but at the end of the day everybody is going to do exactly what they're told. And in the oil field, you know, in a perfect world, that'd be great as a leader, right? Everybody did exactly what you told them to do. It's just not the case, you know, and, and whether it's they're busy and they forget or, you know, I, I don't want to say that they deliberately not listen to you, you know, but I think the repetition, constantly reminding people, that that's very similar. In the military, you you rely on training. When things really hit the fan and you got to move quickly and, and act quickly, there's not a lot of thought that goes into it. You know, it's, it's, it's all muscle memory and repetition, you know. So I think that's one thing that in the oil field, you know, these safety meetings that we have they're they're repetitive they are it works repetition does work you know so i think and, as a leader constantly reminding the guys whether it's bill tickets or you got to tape up a motor this certain way right i mean just just con continuing to remind the guys and finding a way to do that without getting on their nerves is difficult sometimes <laughs> well and especially when as a leader down in the permian basin where we're sitting today you're constantly, you know that any one of these guys could go right down the street and be gainfully employed. Oh, absolutely. So if, if your approach is difficult and that doesn't work for them, they're going to leave. I love what you said about consistently consistency and, and the need to remind. I think as leaders, the sooner we get comfortable with the fact that we're going to do a lot of repeating, the sooner we become satisfied with that. You know, if you try and go down kicking and screaming that I already told Bob that you have to do a daily field ticket, why do I got to tell Bob again? Well, you're, you're probably not going to be a very good leader right, um, right. because folks need that repetition and partly because they frankly didn't come here to do a field ticket. Right. They came here to go do electrical work. Yeah. We're asking them to do a field ticket. Well, I, I remember how it is, you know, when I was, I used to think, and this is where my mind was when I was in the field and it's like, man, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm doing all this work, making this company money and all they do is constantly remind me of stuff that I didn't do. Yeah. You know, it's like... Why don't I just send you my hours and you do the field tickets? You know, you're sitting in the office. As I, as I got into the office and I realized, man, I want to go back to the field. That was easy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Turns out there's a few things you got to do in yeah. the office, isn't there? So that's uh, that was one of the transitions. It was kind of strange for me, you know, when I came here. And this is my first real management position, you know? So it was, it was a lot of learning, just like the repetition thing. At first, it was aggravating. So, you know, Joey would reach out to me and say, hey... Why didn't, you know, so-and-so do his field ticket? Man, I have already told that guy several times, you know? And then now he reaches out to me. I'm like, all right, I'll tell him again, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I think so often when we're reminding folks, we got to remember that we got to get to where they are. you got to get to where, like, literally they're out pulling wire for 10 hours and they're exhausted. And again, right. they, they don't care. They think they did a great job, and they did. Mm -hmm. They did exactly what we asked them to do. They went out, and they pulled wire, and they did a stand-up job. Right. Now we're asking them to do one additional step, 
And it, and it drives our leadership team nuts when I tell them this all the time. Like, guys, you're making it about you. That's why you're mad about it. Yeah. Make it about the employee. And things right. aren't as bad, right? So if, if we make it about the employee that, hey, Bob, tell me how I could get your field ticket. How could I help you get your field ticket done, right? And sometimes you're like, I'm just being honest with you. I'm exhausted on the way home. I'm like, that's I understand that, Bob, because I've been there. But what about Bill who's sitting next to you in the truck? Do you think we could mm-hmm. train him how to do the field ticket? It's a ripoff. He's sleeping while you're driving after you right. pulled wire all day. <laughs> so how about we share this burden a little bit? Whatever strategy you can get to get on their level, always works. I've, I found that approach too a lot of times. If you reach out and, and you're willing to help them accomplish the task, even though it's well known and it's not in your wheelhouse, you know, say field tickets, for example. Then this was something that that you mentioned to me, it's been several months, but you're like, you know, just reach out and ask them, hey, what can I do to help, right? That's kind of a game changer because before when it was, hey, you need to do this, you need to do that, you know, hey, can you get your field tickets in? And now it's like, I see that you're having a hard time with these. What can I do to help? And a lot of times that's enough and they get them done. Well, and this is this is like a little hidden strategy of management. I think in today's world, we have to we have to adapt to the change in environment. You can't find employees. Right. If you do find them, you got to think about retention. But ultimately, people want to feel cared for. And if we're telling them you shall, you must, and you will, that sounds a lot different than can you? How can I help you? Will you? Those are different. Those, that's a different feeling. And especially if you truly, genuinely care about your team members. And yes. so I've had a, a few different folks. Our safety director came from a military background. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because when he, when he first walks in, he's like, neck down, everyone shall, they will. That's just the way the military is. You don't mm-hmm. dispute it. You might have a problem with it, but you go do it anyways. And, and we've really had to coach him to the, to the idea of, hey, in the civilian life, we have to encourage and ask and right. really figure out what we can do better. And he talks a lot about this training thing, which you mentioned. I so wish as an industry in the oil field. It was made sense business-wise to yeah. train people every day. <laughs> I wish we could do it because that's what the military does, right? When oh, you yeah. guys aren't, we're not actively fighting wars no, no, no. all the time. The military is... 99% training and 1% action, you know? And it's probably like the reverse you... in the oil field. Yeah, yeah. It, it would be awesome if you could train for a week and do one service call and right. still make money. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> or, if, or if the producers were willing to pay us to do that, right. right? But the fact is, is that the oil prices are high or there's a drill that just got done. There's there's production that needs today. And right. as we realized in April of 2020 or maybe March of 2020, uh, things can change very, very quickly. Therefore, producers aren't really all that willing to say, hey, why don't you go hire 20 people, put them on the payroll for a year, we'll train them up, and then we'll keep them for the next 10 years. Right. Just really not, not the way it is yeah. in civilian life. But we still get plenty of training opportunities. We try and pair up folks together, right? Isn't that yes. one of your strategies? Yes, sir. And how does that seem to work? It seems to work really well once you get the right fit. It, it's strange to me how you get that cohesiveness of a team, you know, and... and once you get that down, the right people together, they make leaps and bounds. You know, they, they start learning so much that they vibe off each other and they start enjoying their job. And it's so much easier to learn and get better when you enjoy what you're doing, you know? You put two people together that butt heads, well, there's not a whole lot of progress that's made there. So that's been a couple of the things that uh, I've actually had conversations with guys in the field level, you know, helpers, and kind of ask them about my approach to switching people around because my first thought was the more I can expose a helper to different journeymen, the more that he can learn. That was my initial thought. And after talking to people and and kind of seeing how everything was going, I'm kind of leaning more towards you get some guys together and you leave them there for a little while, you know, and then they start opening up and they start learning a little bit more. And I think from the field level, that's where a lot of those guys want to be. They want to be with somebody for an extended period of time. They get in a routine and they start getting comfortable. They start learning things and then once you start learning things, you start enjoying it, you know? And then, then your interest opens up. Right. If you have that foundation, uh, and you only get a foundation through time. Right. And so if you're constantly moving that person around, he's, he's lacking that foundation. Not only that, Jeffrey, but I think when, when two people are working together for an extended period of time, the trust builds. And when trust builds, that's when our brain opens up to be willing to listen to that person's perspective right. and, and just start getting more curious with each other and learning more. To the point, I had a, my uh, one of my high school kids. He was begging to drop out. Of, he wasn't going to drop out of high school. He was going to go to unconventional high school, do things online, and I, I just didn't 
I didn't want that for him. Right. He, I wanted him in the regular conventional system. And we were kind of button heads over this for about a week. And all of a sudden the conversation just disappeared. So two weeks later, I asked him, what, what changed? How come you haven't poked me about that online school business? And he said, you wouldn't believe it, but Mr. So-and-so at the, at the high school, all of a sudden sat him down and he's like, hey, I've noticed you've been kind of falling behind. What can I do to help you out? He said, I thought all my teachers hated me and didn't even want me there. That one teacher saying that one comment to him changed him. No. So my 10th grader is still enrolled in high school and he's going to graduate a happy man. It's crazy when people think that somebody's there to, to help them, you know. Right? Rather than sit there and well, poke, poke at them all the time. That, that was a really cool thing. That I think I learned so much about leadership in the military from both good and bad leaders, you know. You would have two, you know, platoon sergeants, right? They ran, typically we ran like 12 guys, 16 guys in a platoon. So you'd be in charge of roughly 20 people. You would have one that nobody liked, just his approach to, to giving orders and stuff. He would get the job done and this guys would work for him because that's what you had to do. But then you would have another platoon sergeant who, man, this guy could just mention that we needed to get something done and it would be done. The guys wanted to make him look good because they knew that he was trying to make them look good. I, I've been in both companies, both platoons, you know, where the guys under that platoon sergeant, they're going to do the bare minimum to not get in trouble. On the other side of that spectrum, those guys are going to do everything in their power to make that platoon sergeant look good because he cares about them and they care about him. I, I think that right there, just seeing that type of leadership was absolutely amazing to me because looking at it from an employee perspective, you just, you know, this is my boss. Yeah, he's a jerk. You know, he's going to tell me what to do every day and I'm going to do it and then I'm going to get paid. That's kind of the relationship there. Yep. Until you get that leader that you start to realize that, man, this guy, like, he really cares, you know, and I want to do good, not only for myself, but for him. It's just insane how much more things can get done, how much more productive and, and enjoyable the job can be, you know. So when I took this position, that was one of my goals was to be that type of leader, somebody that people wanted to work for, not to get a paycheck, but because I cared about them, I tried to make them successful and, and they did the same for me. I feel like for the most part, that's that's happening here. You know, we, we bring new people in and you got to bring them into the culture and slowly get them there. But, but it's, it's been incredible because I think you started with 11 electricians earlier this year and now you got 22. Yes. So it's working, Jeff. I, I think, it, you know, it, it's just fascinating. I love the compassionate part about leadership, you know, or, or it's called servant style leadership, in my opinion, where you're here to serve your people not for them to serve you, right. but servant style leadership. And and it's really, for me, it's always been there simply because I don't have the same skill set as our field staff. Our electricians could outdo me any day. People can dig trenches way better than I can. Uh, they can do a spill cleanup better than I can. They can automate a location better than I can. So I, I've just always been blown away by our team. I've noticed for some of our managers, it can be more difficult if you have that same exact skill set. Well, for example, our finance team, it's a little bit easier for me to dismiss their worth because I have that capability, right? So I try and keep that in mind when I'm back there. Like, no, these are like my field staff. They're just as good, right? right. They're doing this stuff. But it's funny how if that genuineness behind that compassion has to be there too. Right. You have to genuinely care. And I noticed this last night at our, our Permian Christmas party. Boy, was there 76 people there roughly. Employees. It was a lot bigger than last year. It was it? a lot bigger. <laughs> and they, and many of them brought their significant other, spouse, girlfriend, yeah. what, a fiance. Some of them had a couple kids there. Just a phenomenal group of people. There was no awkwardness in that room whatsoever. From the very beginning of the event to the very end of the event, there was nothing but camaraderie and trust. You right. could just feel it in the room. That's not something you can go buy. It's not something you can teach by doing neck down. It's something that is driven by leaders serving their people. Because I could tell, like when you got up and you talked about your electricians and automation techs, they were hooting and hollering for you. It was the same thing with the, when Luis stood up for the mechanical or Ashley stood up for the environmental. They're rooting for their leader just as much as the leader is rooting for them. Yeah. And that is an incredible point in business. Right. The cool thing here that we have now that, that I've seen grow over the past four to six months is uh, the competition used to be pretty ruthless, you know, and, and it, it's always been a friendly competition. And I say that by environmental versus electrical versus mechanical, you know. We have our own departments and we all work under the same roof. So it, there's always that competitiveness, you know, we're always sharing the hours. Hey, you know, Joey likes to bring up, you know, and, and he likes to he likes to fuse that competition. But now in the past few months, it's, it's getting more and more into the friendly part, you know. Before it was just, we all kind of had our own lanes, you know. And, and yeah, we had the competition and you'd almost genuinely be hurt if somebody beat you, you know. Sure. 
And and now you're, yeah, you might be a little bit upset. Oh man, mechanical got more safety observations than we did. Well, now I can pass that down to my crews and they know those people, you know? So there might be a little trash talk going on, you know? And the next month we know that like, we're going to get them, you know? But it's all friendly and, it, and it's it's just amazing to see that camaraderie that you were talking about. There was a little bit of it here a year ago, but not to the level it's at now. It, no, is, it is insane. It has been incredible to see and be part of uh, yeah. a team that has grown, not just in numbers, because numbers, who cares, right? Those right. those go on a spreadsheet somewhere. No one cares about numbers, but but in a tangible feeling way and, and to see like real personal growth amongst our team members. That whole one roof concept of seeing our, I went out to a new site build that we're doing for one of our producers the other day, and I saw our mechanical and our electricians working together in a way I'd never seen before. Oh, yeah. It, they, they had each other's backs. They knew each other. They were trashing each other. They were supporting each other. They were, it was just awesome. And I, I told our uh, safety director who I was with that this right here is when business is fun. When you can see your team having a good time, that's when you have a good time. Yeah. And I'm telling you a good time, like in the way of camaraderie and respect, and we all have to go to work. So if we can go to work and we can make it as a, a good time as we can, then that's when all of that efforts of trying to get the clients and trying to get the bid hours and trying to get right. the right pricing, all of that stuff, it all comes together when you get out on location. And I mean, I don't know if you were there that day, but the wind was howling bad. Felt like I had drank 16 pounds of dust. <laughs> You know, and those guys were all smiling about it. These guys, they they inspire me because when I was working out here, the weather's always, pretty much always miserable. It's the desert, the wind blows, the dust, the sand. And then when there's no dust and sand, it's just a muddy mess, right? Like the other facility you went to. So the conditions are always pretty poor, but every one of those guys, I mean, they know it's a struggle and they wake up and you see them, you know, they're smiling, they're ready to go to work. I think part of that camaraderie came from when we really slowed down, you know, we went from keeping 18 electricians busy to I think the next week we only had four to five working, right? So we had to shuffle some people around. Well, the guys that we had were just more than willing to go wherever. I had a master electrician pressure washing tanks because mechanical guys needed an extra hand and he didn't have anything to do. And I, I didn't tell him to go over there. You know, I, I simply asked him because I, I know how electricians are. You know, this guy worked really hard to get his master electrician license and somebody's just going to order him to go pressure wash tanks, you know? So I took the approach and I kind of called him up and I was like, hey man, I know you don't have anything going on. Luis was saying he needed some help pressure washing. And he asked who the guy was. He's like, yeah, I'll call him. I'll get with him. I think that day we had a journeyman electrician, a master electrician doing roustabout work and they were smile on their face and happy about it because they were helping their friends you know they were helping their co-workers as opposed to just oh man now i gotta go do some rouse about work you know it's not about the work that you're doing anymore it's about this guy needs help and i know that he's going to come help me when i need it I, I think that shifting around the people between departments they get to know each other better i think that's instrumental to the to the camaraderie that we have you know there's there's no fine line in the sand down here no it just depends on what what we have for the day and how many people we can get on to do it, you know, so. Well, and the needs of the producers are so, like, we call it psychotic. Like, one oh, day yeah. electrical is just crazy it's, busy, then mechanical is nuts, and then environmental is, and and it's not all skilled work every time. You, you need some skilled leaders, you know, foremen, pushers, right. or whatever, the like on the job. But after that, it's like, oh, I just need some able, able and willing bodies to, to, right. to come give a hand. You know, we hired a guy, my most recent hire, He's he just graduated from college, and, and my humble opinion he, he seems like he's better suited for environmental work you know computer work and and using his brain more and not that he can't do the physical labor part right it's just it's harder to come by somebody with a college degree who's educated and can can put together spreadsheets and things like that right so i had the conversation with him and he's just said hey if you if you would be interested you know we can cross train you on environmental and he was excited about it he did not he didn't understand that we could do that you know and then so i had the conversation with ashley and they actually got introduced to each other at the christmas party and now yeah if she needs some help he's going to go cross train with her and you know maybe one day if he decides he wants to do environmental well then he'll go to environmental that's not how companies work it's it's insane that you give us that freedom to be able to do things like that and what it means to those individuals for us to say hey if you want to go to environmental well come on let's go you know yeah. You're going to be a better asset over there. Let's make it happen. Well, that state an individual has went to college for communications and, and the computer stuff. And he didn't, he doesn't necessarily want to be an electrician, but he's, mm -hmm. the cool part about him is he's going to go give that a try. Yeah. Right. Because he also has realized in order to be successful in an office environment or in any kind of a leadership role, you need some field experience. Mm -hmm. And he's willing to go do that. I mean, him and his fiance just moved here. They bought a house here. They're like, yeah. they're what my kids call sending it. They're sending yeah. it, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, and I think they're going to do great. I, uh, 
am really excited for that particular individual, especially we create opportunities here. Yeah. And people say, well, how can you create an opportunity? Well, there you have it. An individual who's willing, doesn't exactly know what he wants to do in life, but come on board. Give the electrical uh, yin yang, give the mechanical a try, give the environmental yeah. a try. Maybe you end up in a leadership role. Maybe you end up as a, a, and especially here in the Permian Basin, those opportunities are everywhere. Oh yeah. You know, just as soon as you have that conversation with them, though, you just see, you know, just a glint of confusion. They don't understand it. You know, you hired me to be an electrician. That's what, that's what my title is. Once you give them those options and those opportunities, it, it's really cool to just to see how much it means to those people. And it, and it, it kind of changes the way they view about Westcom, just in that one little interaction, you know, he's already he's bought in like you said he's in he's sending it he's ready to go <laughs> <laughs> and i think the the really cool thing about west coming i hope it's always this way this is obviously a biased opinion we embrace those young folks who aren't even sure what they want to do we all remember those days when oh, yeah. someone a little bit older and wiser than us took us by the hand and brought us through our life as we've gone through as i've gone through business i've ran into a lot of other business owners and business leaders who forget to embrace people for who they are we're always wanting to change somebody, you know. Well, it's, it's, it's really easy to do, right? It's really easy to say, this is my department. You sit down, you spend hours just thinking about how is it going to work best, right? It's hard to admit that you just, it's not going to work that way, you know? Maybe this guy that I just hired has a better idea than I do. And it is, it's difficult to face sometimes, but... What I've kind of figured out along the way and just the leaders that I've seen is if you come into the job as a leader and you act from day one, you act like you know it, right? You know how this is going to go. I know everything, right? It makes it so much more difficult to take input from someone else. If you come into the job and you get everybody together and say, hey, look, guys, this is our goal. This is where we want to be. This is the plan. Right. If you guys have ideas, let me know. You know, like I'm, I'm pretty open and honest about the electrical side. Like I'm not a great electrician, right? I'm not super familiar with it. I'm more on the automation side. So I have never once told any of our guys that like, oh yeah, I know how to do all this, right? No, it's like, can you show, can you help me figure this out? You know, yeah. taking that approach, it has been so easy just to, to take that input and, and you know, because from day one, I was just, if you guys have some ideas, let me know. Let's let's talk about it. Let's figure out if it'll work, you know. So it, it builds that team up, too. You know, everybody has their input. And it, it changes the way you feel about your job when you feel like if something's wrong, I, I can I can have an input to maybe fix this. You know? And even if it's not wrong yet, I still get an input, which is right. why it's so important not that we just create opportunities, but that we also empower people where they can come up to their leaders and they can say, hey, I have an idea. And let us always be those kind of leaders who embrace that individual because I, I just think way too much nowadays with all the podcasts, all the self-help books, all the books you can read, all the leadership seminars you can go to. We're, we're all trying to be these magical people rather than say, no, I'm Shane Eastolp and this is how I am as a personal person. This is my skill set. Now let's find a spot for me and let's build upon that and let's empower me to be who I am. We so often want to change individuals rather than, I don't want to use the word exploiting, but rather than building upon who they are. Right. Let's build upon who they are rather than trying to change who they are because that is when life is fun is when you get a mix of people some some guy who loves to hunt some guy who loves to fish some guy who loves to be out in his kayak some guy who likes to go paddle boarding some guy who likes to camp in the woods who cares get them all together they're all great electricians we get a great electrical project everyone builds that camaraderie trust happens and and not does the company grow that's a side benefit but the individual grows right. and, and that's when it's really fun you have been through a lot of stress in the last year we put you oh, yeah. through a lot, oh, yeah. growing from 11 <laughs> yeah. people to 22 people. We're, we're talking about diversifying clients. We're talking about diversifying what we do within those clients. we got to get this automation thing kicking off in 2023. There's just a lot on your plate. How in the world do you keep your cool? I think by nature, I was just a, I was a pretty calm person. You know, I don't get, ex I don't get excited too much, but uh, to build upon that, my job in the military, you know, man, you, you just had to be calm. There was no way around it. They, they did what was called these peer evals, right? So not only did you have to pass the school, but if the guys don't like you that you're working with, well, then they will give you a bad period of and you get kicked out of school. So if you couldn't keep your cool and somebody couldn't trust you, well, yeah, they're you wouldn't, you wouldn't last. So it, I think that was a, it was just a personality trait that I had naturally. I, I keep pretty calm head in stressful situations, but then on top of that, the military took that and built upon it, you know, and, and trained me for those situations. Don't get me wrong. I lose my cool sometimes. I get, I get kind of worked up and I think Joey gets an earful a lot of times, but he does a pretty good job of calming back down. When I do get worked up, it's short lived, you know, and it'll be a quick 
conversation between me and Joey. By the end of it, I'm, I'm good to go. Which is why it's so cool to have somebody that you can lean on like that. Oh, yeah. And so often, I mean, I do the same thing to Joey. You know, I call him, what are you? Yeah. <laughs> Talks me off a ledge, and from time to time, Joey will call me and do this right, thing, right? Right, right. That's, that's uh, what we do with, as leaders with each other. No doubt, what you've seen in Afghanistan probably has put a little different perspective as well as to what oh, yeah. really qualifies as a big deal and what doesn't. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think the big deals now are driven for different reasons, you know? Like, uh, I, I want to be successful. I, I want Joey to be successful. I want Les Con to be successful. So the stress that I get now, it has nothing to do with, oh man, I'm gonna lose my job if we don't do this. No. It's we're all working together to make this place better and everyone around me is holding up their end of the deal i have to there's no way around it i can't be the weak link <laughs> you know it doesn't work that way so i, I think it's just it's self-driven and that that does cause a lot of stress right it's not all good but I, I think there's a lot of good qualities that come from that you know i don't care if i have to stay 10 o'clock at night if i, if I got to do something i'm going to do it and, but i think the bad side of that too is yeah you're you get worked up when things don't go how they should be because there are there are times that things just don't go right things don't work out the right way and i get a i get a lot of feedback you know from yourself from joey hey next time let's let's do it this way let's try to do this man i just myself individually i've grown so much over this past year you know coming into this i had no idea who westcom was you know i knew that i knew the oil field i knew the automation side not a whole lot about the electrical side i was getting into a lot of unknowns so the coaching and, and teachings that i've had along the way have been awesome i don't see them slowing down and if they do then that's not good because i'm not going to grow anymore <laughs> well and it's the same thing for joey and i right we're still learning and growing and i, I think that's the cool part about life jeffrey we have so much more to cover in another podcast i I think anyone who listens to this podcast has an idea who Jeffrey is. We're always looking for electrical and automation techs, but more importantly, just the whole story of how much America needs us and our energy that we bring to the table. You've done a phenomenal job in helping us do that out of the Permian Basin over the last year. I'm really excited to see what 2023 brings for you and your entire team. I, I know we're going places. So send it. Yeah. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Thank you, sir.